Hello and welcome to Philoxenia. We are this time in London and in Somerset and not in Vienna in Kreisky Forum because we are closed for COVID-19 disaster. But we have the opportunity to speak today to my guest Aviva Wittenberg-Cox. She is a strategy consultant who works with companies in uh, academic institutions. She also writes books. One of her specialities is gender issues, gender balance issues. And she wrote an article recently in Forbes magazine, which was shared widely on the internet, uh, about the fact that it seems that especially countries managed by female prime ministers and presidents happen to be particularly good in containing the crisis. Or to be fair, say everyone has a big problem getting through this crisis uh, without too many casualties. But those countries with female prime ministers seem to be better in managing it. So welcome, Aviva, first of all. Thank you very much. Lovely to be with you. I hear you in Somerset in your barn and isolation becomes you. <laughs> I think uh, there's nothing like being given permission to stop. That's not a bad thing. It's very, very uh, productive. So yes, I've been doing a lot of writing. That's very good. So when you saw uh, that the corona crisis is putting an immense uh, pressure on all governments in the entire world, uh, when did you realize that you thought that women were actually doing a, a quite good job in comparison to some of the men? You know, not all men as prime ministers are incapable of managing that. Well, I think like, like probably many of the people listening to us, we've all become news junkies in this crisis, right? We're locked up in places where we can't move and we're consuming a lot of news about what is going on. And it's because it's really the first experience we've all had of something completely global that we're sharing. We're all living through this together at the same time. It's actually been really interesting for anybody who's interested in politics or the world or humanity to be comparing what are different countries doing and what is the impact of what they're doing on their people um, and because i'm also a student of leadership i'm i have just been innocently on the sidelines watching what kind of leaders emerge on the world stage as we go through this and it became as i was reading there were just more and more articles pointing to a certain number of countries that were doing some things well um, and achieving reasonable results, but also in a way that created and built trust, which is something that we don't have a lot of in our political leaders right now. And so when I started to dig a little bit into some of these countries, it just hit me that being the gender expert that I am, and I tend to see a lot of things through a lens of gender, that a lot of these leaders happen to be women. So the first point you make in your article, if we just go through it, because I thought these four particular points told us a lot about how, what you need to manage a crisis uh, that involves uh, very young and very old people and everyone in the middle too. So the first uh, topic that you picked was truth. Yeah, well, I find it really interesting. <laughs> like, how do political leaders talk to their people? Is it uh, a sort of adult adult relationship where, because also for the first time in history, if I follow um, a Cambridge professor, what's his name, who does the podcast called Talking Politics, this is one of the first times where a lot of our populations are as old or older than our population, uh, than our political leaders. So it's no longer appropriate for political leaders to be talking down to us or imagining that we don't know <laughs> what's going on or how to read and think. Um, and so I think what I have found interesting in a lot of these women is they're not dumbing down. Um, they're not taking us to war. They're not militarizing their speeches. They are saying we are up against a scientific problem and we have the human ingenuity to address it calmly and factually and there's no big you know brouhaha but nor do they take kid gloves and hide the facts right angela merkel came out and said 70 percent of us may catch this it's serious take it seriously i wish we could have had those kind of words earlier in the uk 
Yeah, that's true. We are, of course, in the UK, in the US especially, used to this kind of pompous populist speeches where people stopped uh, believing a word these people say. And uh, in the UK, it's pretty drastic at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, and I'd say, you know, the counter example of watching the sort of feminine end of the leadership spectrum is the opposite, strong men, authoritative, um, autocrat rising in a number of countries. Uh, and it's not just the U.S. and the U.K. I wish it was, right? We've got a little bunch of countries that are going uh, authoritarian on us, even here in Europe. And that's terrifying. And they have a very, very different way of talking to their people and really um, managing untruth um, in order to dominate and take power. Well, the second point that you make is decisiveness. Decisiveness, of course, can play both ways. You have that, for example, in China too. You know, remember in February when we saw people being sort of caught with, uh, with hoods over their head and pulled away because they were sort of trying to get out of uh, being checked. Yeah? So the decisiveness can be very authoritarian too. So what's the specific female decisiveness that we would applaud? Uh, well, again, I think it's linked to truth, recognize the truth and say so, then be very clear and transparent about what are we going to do about it and move quickly. But be uh, good at sharing with people why we're going to do this. So in Taiwan, uh, the leader there very clearly explained the 124 measures that she immediately decided to enact and communicated them and told people, okay, here's all the things we're going to do. No wishy-washy, no nothing. Um, and I think when people are scared and there's danger around, that kind of calm decisiveness that doesn't feel exploitative or somebody trying to use uh, the context to take power uh, is very necessary. That's true. And it's a very good example of how Asian states can be democratic and successful is uh, is Tsai Ping Wang in Taiwan, but also the South Korean. South uh, Korean, absolutely. That quite well is, aimed, by the way. Not, and, and I never wanted to uh, suggest that only women would lead well. It's just interesting to me that we don't have that many women leaders around the world, and this is the first big crisis they are all facing together. And so I just found it's interesting that they share a certain number of these characteristics. That's true. The third topic is tech. How comes tech into this, which we would uh, associate maybe with classic male uh, uh, capabilities? See, but that's what I love. All those first three characteristics, truth telling, telling it straight from the shoulder, decisiveness, use of technology, harnessing tech to trace people, test them, get organized with the means we have today are typically seen as masculine traits. And yet, what I find absolutely clear is these great women leaders are all using the same tools in very convincing ways. Um, and those aren't feminine, they're not feminine traits, they're good leadership traits. So yes, using and harnessing technology is, as we now have all learned, one of the absolutely key ways of getting out of this crisis without locking down entire populations for lengths of time that mean our economies are going to be the next pandemic that get us, right? Um, and I think just this sort of no nonsense, I mean, again, I'm living in the UK, so I'm suffering from the lack of truth, decisiveness, and tech. Uh, like, what is it with these developed nations that can't get a simple app to track? I, I'm just astonished. We're supposed to be at the leading edge of technology. Um, and I think some of these other countries and these Scandinavian countries in particular and Taiwan were much earlier. And I've just done some research. Uh, Bangladesh, led by a woman, harnessed tech right away, testing, tracking. Why can they do it? And we can't. Um, well, your example in the article is the Icelandic uh, Prime Minister Katrin Jakobsdottir. What did she do? In particular. She actually harnessed, uh, which I think again is just an innovation that some of these women bring, she harnessed social media and immediately dragged in even very young influencers. So influencers is not something most governments rely on to relay their messages and understanding the power of today's youth 
to buy into and then relay and explain to a lot of people, including their elders, you have to stay home, you have to do this, uh, this is how we're gonna track you, was I think a, a, a shot of genius, right? In that and why don't we learn faster from that? Why aren't we now all using the same tactics? That would be good. That would be good, except that many people would have a problem with uh, tracking because of the data security and that we give away our, our private information to big brother states that might afterwards not give up the right to spy on us in that way. Absolutely, but I think there are tracking uh, modules being developed that are very carefully not doing that and limiting it and we're getting there in some places. I think her use of those influencers was more to inform and educate about what this thing yeah. was and why it was important and why to stay inside. So I think it was uh, used more as a communication vehicle than as a source of tracking data. Yeah, it's very Scandinavian. It would be very strange if they would be sort of the big brother kind of uh, supervisor state. Uh, the fourth uh, term that you used was my favorite, of course, love. <laughs> How does love come into this? Well, I use love because it's such a word that everybody runs away from, you know, and it's so classic that women are trying to ape male leadership styles in order to succeed. And I had to laugh that the first three were very classic male, um, male perceived strategies. And so the one that I really wanted to use as the differentiator was the tone with which a lot of these women are leading. And I think tone from the top is absolutely key um, and that they do everything they do and you feel that they do it because they love the people they are responsible for and that is something you don't always get from your political leaders who talk down at you who use you who seem to be more interested in their own careers or power than in your the health and well-being of all their citizens um, too many uh, of the other end of the spectrum again are you you know are preaching um, words of hate and divisiveness and setting up people against other people in their own countries i think what these women have done is radical inclusion uh, i use the example of eva sorenberg in norway who has now twice done press conferences devoted to communicating and answering the questions only of children um, which I think is, again, one of these shots of innovative genius. When have we ever seen politicians talk to the nation's children? Well, of course, it would be a woman who'd do that, one would think, just because, yeah, on the whole, women have spent a little bit more time with children and understand their fears and how useful it is to have a credible authority figure help us poor hapless parents who may not know how to explain to our children what the hell is going on to actually be able to point to a television and say here's our leader will explain it to you i think is absolutely brilliant and i think love is a super powerful force that i think some men are learning from right uh, when you see andrew cuomo in new york um, and some of the others i think they're imbibing some of this idea so i hope that the characteristics uh, that I've listed aren't only for women to use, right? Men can use them too. It oh, would make do hope so. I will put links to your work and also your biography um, next to the video when we post it in Kreisky Forum's website and online in social media. Just to say that you are Swiss French Canadian with an Israeli first name uh, and an American English pronunciation. So you are sort of a, a product of the Western world. But when I uh, called you to set up this talk, you were saying you're already working on part two, which is not uh, the developed world necessarily, but Sam, you, you're looking now for your second part of female leadership in Corona crisis times, you're looking at developing countries, mostly, you said. Which ones? So, yes, because after that first uh, article, I was, of course, bombarded with all the countries with women leaders that I had not included. So um, <laughs> in an effort of inclusion, we're looking at Ethiopia, Nepal, Namibia, Bangladesh, Bolivia, Georgia, Barbados, Singapore, 
and I'll slip in Hong Kong as well, even though it's not quite a country. That's but these are all places run by women. And I think it's also just the realization, as I did researching this article, that women now lead 550 million people on the planet. And we're on the way up. Very good. Excellent talking to you, Aviva. Thank you very much. Sei gesund and we'll speak soon. Dankeschön. Bye-bye. <laughs> Ciao. Yeah.